Your sensors are correct. Do not adjust your heading. Your heading. You've discovered the Omega Particle. Streaming to the Alpha Quadrant and beyond. 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 Here's your host. The Anchorman of the Federation. The Doctor of Dilithium. This is Jonathan Wiegand. Welcome to the Omega Particle Podcast. I am your anchor man of the Federation, Jonathan Wiegand, with half my brain tied behind my back, just to make it fair. So today we are discussing Season 2 episode, Among the Lotus Eaters. And again, this is just a hit machine of Strange New Worlds, just keeps on coming. And we get another one this week. And this is probably my favorite of the season, to be sure. I've just been really impressed with this episode in general. I feel like a lot of you have too. I know the critics definitely have been. So I think it's just points to, you know, deeper trauma within the crew, comments on the human condition. But we're going to cover all of that and more. And just for podcasting notes and announcements, we have cooking up something very special in the background for OPP might be another live episode review, but this time we're thinking about doing with like alcohol, like, but look for that in the next coming week. And however we, we do, as we're going through our news and things like that today, we do want to give out congratulations where congratulations are due. So the television Academy and has announced that it's nominations for the 75th annual Emmy awards. And The only Star Trek show to be honored this year was actually Picard. They just had two nominations from the show, and they are two makeup nominations for the third season. I think one's like prosthetic. Is that right, Luna? Luna the intern, everybody. And the other is just like non-prosthetic, so it's kind of interesting. I don't know. The funny thing is if you keep researching like Emmy nominations, and that's what I do because I have a Star Trek podcast, and that's what I like. So Star Trek hasn't had this few emmy nomination since 2018 when only the first season of discovery was up for contention and they started rolling out this new trek however the past four years star trek franchise has averaged around five nominations each year only to have two is a little lower and if you're just curious for reference during the peak or as i like to call the golden age of star trek during the mid 90s star trek routinely and regularly got up to 12 nominations a year so we're not getting any love for the new trek from the television academy like we did for the old school trek plus a big update on the strike if you're not aware the the writers guild has been on strike for several months we have a podcast i think we released in may is that right luna may Uh, so definitely check that out you can learn more in depth why they want to strike and then also how does that affect star trek and you as a fan personally so now this is a whole nother juggernaut because now we have the actors guild or sag so we have wag and we have sag and who comes up with these names i'm i get like the actors guild come on so anyway sag has joined wag on the picket line and so that pretty much halts hollywood production on everything so we might maybe get some longer delays in Trek shows now. However, you kind of, I understand the right to fight for money that they deserve and the streaming. And that now that the business plans have changed and you have AI bringing into the mix, especially with the writing. So it's, it's different. Like I mentioned last week's in review, like the studios can just like write off shows entirely. So that means you don't get paid anymore. So instead of having a show on maybe for, you know, a few years and you get residuals, you get none of that now. So it definitely needs to kind of be reviewed for everybody and works out for the studios and the guilds and all that good stuff. However, that's not why we've come here today. (laughs) And it is not to discuss strikes or makeup nominations. It is to get into Among the Lotus Eaters and deep dive into this emotional episode. So Luna, let's light this candle.
due to its inherently episodic format, you know, Strange New Worlds really has set itself apart from a lot of other Trek series, in my opinions, because literally every week, I don't know what I'm going to get. It's a very... It's kind of like when you were a kid and they had Beanie Babies at McDonald's and you didn't know which one you were going to get. Were you going to get, you know, the Ireland bear or were you going to get like the bull? (laughs) It's just, you you never know what you got. And so that was kind of the fun, exciting part of it. And that's kind of what Strange New Worlds is. It's like, are we finally going to get an episode that lays an egg? Are we finally going to get an episode, you know, that might deal with Captain Pike and the beep beep chair and the future and all that? Who knows? But the show boldly, you know, embraces a diverse range of genres, tones, narrative styles throughout its runtime, and definitely captivating. I mean, we even had a freaking courtroom legal drama to alternative timelines in Toronto, and now we get this huge emotionally charged journey and it comments on the human condition and pain and grief. So it's like, can they just like calm down a minute and maybe get like a Tuvix episode in there at some point? Just saying. (laughs) So, although the fourth episode of the second season initially appears, you know, to follow the familiar pattern of having an away mission adventure, this very much defies expectations and provides to be anything more in anything other than ordinary. I think it really, this entire hour, showcases the exceptional talent that Strange New Worlds has in bridging gaps, you know, with with the own Star Trek canon, which is a very difficult thing to do again it's kind of like talking about picard season three they're making it look easy and it's not fair because it's a very difficult thing to do aka discovery aka the first two seasons of picard it's not something that you can mess around and move around in canon wise so this particular episode stands out but it just gives me a new insight and it gives a very cool small throwaway tagline you know, from the original series, I think it was the actual first pilot, The Cage. So we get this random tagline, and then we get all of a sudden get this whole episode. And we're going to be talking about that in our Easter eggs and deep dive into that a little bit more. But to me, it really kind of excels as an installment, you know, Star Trek as a whole, because it blends. And I'm talking about Strange New Worlds now, not, not this episode. So it just kind of has this like gentle horror and romance and rom- anyway i'm just repeating myself but anyway it is granted this cast to kind of really stretch their wings and offer new insights and again these characters that are 50 plus years old getting new insights and other side of these characters is exceptionally difficult i mean especially if they've had what like six movies and three seasons of a tv show now we're seeing new sides of them that we haven't before so i was like pike and spock and i'm number one so it's it's definitely amazing so that's been my opening pitch for Among the Lotus Eaters, and it's kind of a recap again. But going into the actual episode, so this episode revolves around the Enterprise being sent back to Rigel 7 to try and like clean up a lot of this cultural contamination from its previous visit to this Bronze Age society five years prior. And whenever they say Rigel 7, it just I don't know why, but I think of the Futurama, the big green guys from Futurama, it's like, Rigel 5 or whatever and it's just like I can't help but think it even though I know that's a parody of Star Trek it's just I can't help it so I was kind of took me out of the episode considerably so Pike, Leanne and Bengua go undercover among the Kalar people in an attempt to discover what it is they left behind only they get captured because the planet has this weird ringing sound and this was probably hands down so people I have watched Star Trek for probably over 10 years. I've seen every episode of Star Trek there is from the animated series, Prodigy, to Strange New Worlds now. And the golden age of Star Trek, I've seen those shows probably four or five, six times. This by far was the most annoying sequence in all of Star Trek. It messed with my cat. He ran around. He hated the ringing. I didn't like it. It bothered me. I was like, this is so annoying. And it just is like completely just like nuke bombs anything that I'm trying to like enjoy with the episode. So definitely didn't like that. Probably just again my biggest worst attribute of any Star Trek episode is this that massive ringing. But anyway, after they're captured, this revelation that one of the Enterprise presumed 
dead former crew members has apparently just taken over the planet using, you know, Starfleet tech and installed himself as High King, as one naturally does, and just completely shocks Pike, who is, you know, clearly tormented by the idea of leaving somebody behind. But the group soon has a bigger problem to face because they namely get involved with something called the Forgetting. And as you guys, just a recap of the episode, the forgetting is just if you're outside, it's a form of radiation. If you're outside the castle walls, which the walls are made of ore, it makes you forget everything in your life. And so a lot of people have um, tattoos, as we see in the Keldar Fieldman. He has certain tattoos to help him remember, but he decides to blot them out. We're definitely going to get into that. Again, the comment on the whole human nature aspect, but before we get into that, I was very curious about the title of this episode, A Lotus Eater. So it made me just do get on the quick Google machine, as boomers say, and, and kind of deep dive into what is a lotus eater. So this is apparently a tip of the hat to Greek mythology, particularly Homer's epic, The Odyssey. And in The Odyssey resides a tale of the Lotus Eaters. So it's a narrative that serves as a clear inspiration for this episode, and it's, I mean, aptly named for the aforementioned myth. In this ancient story, a community of island inhabitants heavily relies on the lotus plant as their main sustenance. However, consuming this plant induces a narcotic effect, leading those who partake to exist in a state of tranquil indifference. Consequently, individuals who encounter these island dwellers, they become ensnared in the allure of the lotus, gradually forgetting their own lives, loved ones, and places of origin, and this end up there forever. And similarly, on planet Rigel 7, this, like I mentioned before, that radiation from the surrounding area and this asteroid affects everyone to lose their memories and lose their memories at night and kind of restart every day. And it effectively fragments their society into two distinct groups, those who refrain and retain their personal identities and those who from suffer their amnesia. And subsequently, when Pike and his companions find themselves imprisoned and stripped of all their recollections of their own identities and relationships with one another, they must embark on a quest to kind of reveal and unravel the mysteries of their true, true selves and true origins. And for me, it was a very thought-provoking episode, raising, you know, a lot of interesting questions that deep dive into the depths of human nature, what it is, like, who we are as a people. Is it our, if you remove everything around us, like our memories, do we still have the same compassion? Do we still have the same moral fiber, that same foundation of who we are? Uh, and it also brings into, like, what holds values for us? What about our own existence around this whole world? And to me, what I really got out of this episode, you know, was the fact that how to deal with grief and pain, especially for my own life as somebody, I've dealt with a lot of grief in my in my, in my short life. I wouldn't say short. Shut up, Luna. She's laughing at me. I'm in my mid-30s, okay? It's kind of young. But so my mother passed away when I was 12 years old of cancer, and I was definitely grief and traumatic moment but also you know going through the usual stuff growing up like heartbreaks and things like that and one thing I've learned is that when it comes to grief you can't forget it you can't move on you can't bury it you can't blot out you know the tattoos on your arm so you just don't remember because it's just easier that way as that Keldar Fieldman said he's like it's just easier to forget I just it's better not to know and to me, I feel like that is never a healthy way to resolve anything. And a lot of people do do that because it's an easy thing to do that instead of facing the pain, looking in the eyes and confronting it and dealing with it, living with it, struggling with it. And especially, you know, losing a parent, I can say it never really goes away. You kind of always just have it with you. And this is what that episode clearly brought out and commented on so beautifully. So, and that's very hard to do. Again, this is Star Trek. We're talking about Keldarns and, you know, radiation. And you got freaking the Ortega lady saying, I fly the ship. <laughs> so it's just like on the backdrop, then dealing with these heavy emotional human nature conditions and, and how one different people 
deal with problems and grief in life. So I thought that was beautifully done, and uh, it's really hard to do. So hats off to the, the writers and the staff of Strange New Worlds for doing that. And speaking of Ortega, I just thought, I mean, that was a good, like, comedy relief. It was good to kind of see that, like, even at the very essence of her being, she remembered what to do. There was that emotional connection. And even with Leanne's, you know, sort of default nature or in Bengua's eventual realization, you know, that he's like, hey, I can, like, fight and I'm a formidable force. I have combat skills. His true calling lies in healing and, and helping the ease the suffering of others. So I love how each character undergoes profound revelations that unravel, you know, their essence of their individuality, pretty much. And, of course, we see that with Pike. He, you know, embodies this leader we have come to know and appreciate and a compassionate individual who holds the well-being of others in high regards and places his utmost value on the people he holds dear, often, like, proprietizing their needs over his own. And, of course, there are some interesting uh, fleeting glimpses of his darker side to his character that one like maybe hope we might get to see in future episodes like for example like when he's about to kill oh i forget his name his name is saving me but he's about to kill like this fake high king former starfleet guy and then he boom instantly regained his memory he's like oh i'm not gonna kill you that's not me it's like whoa so he has like this this dark side inside of him we'll have to see but in this particular episode a significant catalyst emerges in the form of a talisman bestowed upon Pike by his, I wouldn't say it's quasi-romantic, it's definitely romantic interest in Captain Patel. And this precious token, like, not only aids Pike in reestablishing and anchoring his profound bond with both his identity and his comrades, but it also instills in him the realization that he owes Captain Patel a genuine opportunity for a meaningful relationship. As you guys know, the episode culminates with Pike extending a heartfelt apology to her and making a sincere commitment to embark on this romantic journey with her, despite, you know, the undeniable fact that their Starfleet duties come first as captains, and, you know, they're going to have a lot of, you know, date nights and stuff like that. They're going to be put on the back burner many months without seeing one another. It's definitely not an easy road. I like how Pike progressed in this episode because he realized... Yeah, I, I do that. I self-sabotage when anybody tries to get close and then realize, oh my gosh, I need that need for connection. How emotionally she meant to him when he didn't know why it was important for him to hold on to the talisman, but he knew he needed to get back whoever gave it to him. So I thought that was really cool that, you know, it, he couldn't deny his true feelings to his, like, forgetful self, quote-unquote, made an effort and hopefully we'll see some more of that relationship i don't know it remains i mean uncertain this entanglement between pike and baton and because i mean do i just don't know a lot of about captain patel not a lot of people do i mean i don't even know her first name i've looked on a couple forums and say there's some idea but we don't i don't even know it. it's kind of a mystery to me yeah and like i said like there's some I definitely think that Strange New Worlds will eventually get into this worthwhile endeavor, delving into this narrative of their love and trying to make it work. It's just simply a matter of time. I think they'll eventually get there. Could even be this season. Who knows? But let us remain hopeful that, you know, it's going to happen. Yeah, and I guess, you know, by this juncture and by the end of getting close to the end of this review, you can tell that. I feel a lot of what I do every week is very repetitive, you know, to emphasize that this particular episode this week stands. It's a remarkable addition to the season and again to the series. It's just, it's just again, a continuous string of extraordinary episodes, which I'm very happy. And this consistent excellence of the show is almost indulgent. Like, it makes me feel incredibly fortunate that we get it, but I'm also waiting for the shoe to drop. Maybe that's just my personality. But it does have a mastery over its characters, and I heard that next week's episode is going to be really about Spock and delving into his humanity and Vulcan self, so that sounds phenomenal. So they definitely have maybe another hit on their hands, we'll have to see, but to me it's definitely a just a remarkable gift in the form of a series that it's done so well, and keeping to that OG Star Trek sci-fi commentary that we all love so much 
So that has been our review on Among the Lotus Eaters. And before we leave today, we're going to definitely talk about the biggest Easter egg here of the day. And that is the Cage prequel kind of quote. So as I mentioned in the introduction that the episode was basically one giant callback to Trek's pilot episode origin. And I'm sure as many of you are aware, the first Star Trek episode produced was called The Cage. And it's a pilot in an, it was a, with a guy called Jeffrey Hunter who played Pike. But it was never picked up. And then the rest is history, as we all know. And the episode was featured prominently in TOS's The Men Menagerie and then Discoveries If Memory Serves. The callback to this episode here is not in the presence of Telosians. Rather, it focuses on Pike's adventure on Rigel 7, which took place shortly before the events of the cage. In the episode, the minor character of Human Colt is placed in the Enterprise after the quote-unquote death of Pike's previous yeoman on Rigel 7. Outside of the iconic fight scene, it was little more than like a throwaway line. So for such a small line, the fact that the previous yeoman gets to be an antagonist of an episode is amazing. Until this episode, he didn't even really have a name. The comic series Early Voyagers, which you know Strange New Worlds has taken a little bit of information from, called him Dermot Cusack. Here, his name is Zach Nugent. Not only does this obscure character get to kind of return, but it's a great mirror for how Pike is so different, you know, five years after his mission. So that's the main Easter egg that we're going to get into today. There really, I mean, there was a few other ones, but and they're so small and like throwaway, I don't like to really get into them. But that's the big ones. And that has been a review on the Lotus Eaters. Luna, let's wrap it up. Thank you all so much for listening and really appreciate interacting with you and, and shout out to my man in Portugal. It was awesome kind of conversing with you on Instagram for a little bit and definitely your comment made my day. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And again, if you guys want to reach out on social media, I love talking Trek with fans from all over the world. It's so awesome. And then again, a little bit of news. We will be continuing our Strange New Worlds reviews, but we're also throwing in some fun, random stuff because, you know, not everybody watches Strange New Worlds. And according to our statistics, Luna, definitely not as many people watch this Picard because I feel like our our viewer, our rates are like cut almost like in half from what it was with Picard. Yeah, so not a lot of people don't like Strange New Worlds as much as Picard, which... I don't blame him. Picard was bringing people out of the woodwork. Like I have friends that, you know, never watch any new Trek, but they watch, they didn't even watch the first two seasons of Picard, but they watched the third one. So either way, before I get rambling again, remember guys, take care of yourselves out there. Always, you know, prioritize your mental health. Let, if you need to talk to somebody, talk to somebody, please do. And as always, second start of the right, straight on till morning.